Okay, so this evening we want to look at something called centripetal motion. Uh, centripetal motion has to do with things which are moving in a circle also. Except in this case, the object which is moving in a circle's velocity kind of changes and also kind of doesn't change. In the sense that uh, we have an object moving in a circle at the same velocity in terms of magnitude but since the object is moving in a circle that particular object's direction is going to change now recall that velocity is a vector it is it's made up of uh magnitude and direction so if the magnitude of the velocity doesn't change as in what you're going to be looking at in this case with centripetal motion uh then the magnitude doesn't change but the direction in which the object is moving changes then that also constitutes what is referred to as acceleration. So we're going to look at something called centripetal acceleration, which is the acceleration an object undergoes as it is moving in a circle at a constant speed. So you basically, with centripetal motion, you have things moving at the same speed, but the direction of these particular objects, they're moving, the direction in which an object is moving changes so because the speed which is the magnitude is the same but the direction in which this particular object is moving is changing then that constitutes a change in velocity since the direction is changing then you end up having acceleration the acceleration which happens in this case which happens in such a manner that is what you're referring to as centripetal acceleration uh, as we are going to show also from Newton's second law of motion, if you have got acceleration then and you've got an object moving in a circle, the mass of that particular object is not what's causing the acceleration. The acceleration is actually caused by a force. So if you have an object undergoing a particular type of acceleration, there must be a force which is causing that particular acceleration. So we're going to see how to work out the centripetal force and also we're also going to look at examples of different types of forces which can give us this centripetal force so as you can see here we've got two equations uh ac which is a centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed of the particular object divided by the radius uh, the speed squared divided by the this is one of the fundamental expressions for working out the centripetal acceleration with centripetal acceleration and centripetal motion the speed with which a particular object is moving in the circle is the same. The speed does not change. What is changing is the direction. Because the speed remains the same, but the direction in which the object is moving cha constantly changes, that particular object's velocity is changing, hence you have got acceleration. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at centripetal acceleration. So in this case, you have an object of mass m it can be a small object it can be a big object it doesn't really matter but what you have is with an object of mass m which is moving with a constant speed v round a circle of radius r so in this case the speed is the same so there is no change in speed which means the acceleration in this case is not coming from the change in speed because the speed is always the same it is v the acceleration, this centripetal acceleration, is coming about as a result of the fact that this particular object's direction, the direction in which this particular object is moving, is changing. So the, dire the direction is changing, but the speed remains the same. So if there is a change in direction, then the velocity is changing. If the velocity is changing, then it means that there is acceleration. So in this case, since the object is moving with the same speed, there is no change in the magnitude of the, of the velocity. The speed is the same. However, because there is a change in direction, if the direction changes, then you're talking about velocity. So there's a new velocity, and if there's a new velocity, if the velocity continues to change, then it means that that particular object is undergoing an acceleration, and the acceleration which this particular object is undergoing is what is referred to as centripetal. Centripetal basically means that this particular object is accelerating towards the center of whatever this circle is of radius r. 
So objects which are moving in a circle, they are actually undergoing an acceleration and they are trying to accelerate towards the center of this particular circle. The acceleration which this particular object is going, which is AC, is going to be is given by the speed of the object, which is V squared, divided by R, which is the radius of the circular track in which this particular object is moving. Are we clear on what centripetal acceleration is? And why the centripetal acceleration? How it comes about? It is because of the change in direction which this particular object is going to be constantly undergoing as it goes around the circle. The change in direction causes the velocity to change as much as the size of the speed is the same, but because the direction is changing, that brings about an acceleration, which is what you're referring to as centripetal acceleration, because the object accelerates toward the center of this circular track. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So we have our centripetal acceleration AC is equal to the speed V squared divided by R. Now we know where V, of course, is the velocity. So not the velocity, is the speed of this particular object in meters per second. And V R is, of course, the radius. Now we know that the speed or the velocity V is also related to the radius and also to how to the angular velocity of this particular object how fast this particular object is going in a circular path you've got v is equals to uh, r multiplied by omega so if we get this v equals to r multiplied by omega we substitute it here where we got v so we're going to end up with ac is equals to r omega squared divided by R. So you're going to end up with the R squared, omega squared divided by R. So you're going to end up with AC is equal to R omega squared. So this is the centripetal acceleration also. So there are two ways in which you can work out the centripetal acceleration depending on what you have. If you know the speed of the object, which is a V, V squared divided by R is going to give you centripetal acceleration. But also if you know how fast this particular object is going around the circular track, Meaning that if you know the angular velocity, then you can work out the centripetal acceleration as R is equals to omega squared, like this. So AC is equals to R omega squared, and also AC, which is a centripetal acceleration, is equals to V squared over R. There. Is that clear? Yep. Now, the next thing is this is acceleration so if you have an acceleration an acceleration is caused by a force so basically what this lesson or lecture is trying to tell you is that objects do not move in a circle because they like to move in a circle any object which is moving in a circle is moving in a circle because it is being forced to move in a circle if you have something moving in a circle, it's doing so because it is being forced to move in a circle and not because it likes to move in a circle. It doesn't have any choice. You move in a circle because you are being forced to move in a circle. Okay, that's the first thing. Because this thing of moving in a circle creates or produces an acceleration and we know from Newton's second law of motion that the acceleration if you have an object of mass m undergoing an acceleration a there must be a force which is causing that particular acceleration so in this case you can work out the centripetal the centripetal force which is the force which is causing this object to move in a circle fc as equals to the mass of the object moving in a circle multiplied by the centripetal acceleration ac so this is how you work out the centripetal force we know the acceleration. One of the formulas for acceleration AC is equal to V squared of R. So if you substitute for AC here, you put this expression here, you're going to end up with uh, the centripetal force being equal to the mass multiplied by V squared of R. So you end up having this. FC is equal to the mass multiplied by the velocity squared divided by R. This is one way of working out the centripetal force, depending on what you have. 
if you know the mass of the object, you know the speed of the object, you also know the radius of the circular track in which this particular object is moving, then you can work out how much force is required to keep this particular object in that circular track. Are we clear? So there is a force which is required for something to move, continue moving in a circle. If this force is not there, then an object will prefer to move in a straight line. If there is no force, which is there is no centripetal force, then that particular object will move in a straight line, continue moving in a straight line at constant velocity. Is this clear? This expression of centripetal force. Yes, sir. You can also work out the centripetal force by substituting this. AC is equals to R omega squared. When you make that substitution, so you end up having uh, the centripetal force is equals to the mass multiplied by the centripetal acceleration like this. So in this case, when you do that, you end up having this. The centripetal force is equals to the mass of the object, the radius of the object, and the angular velocity squared. So there are two ways, again, also of working out the centripetal force. The centripetal force Fc is going to be equal to the mass of the object, the speed of the object divided by the radius squared, and also the mass of the object, the radius of the circular track multiplied by the angular velocity of the object, which is how fast this particular object is moving in a circle. Is that clear? Are we clear? Clear, sir. Okay. Now, yes, sir. Next bit: the different phases of centripetal force. Now, there are different types of forces which provide centripetal force. Centripetal force is not one type of force. It's different types of forces which provide the centripetal force depending on the circumstances. For example, kinetic friction force, which is the first one which I have here. Kinetic friction force is required. There has to be kinetic friction when a car is, under, is going around a roundabout. When a car goes around a roundabout, that roundabout is usually a circle. So the car is forced to move in a circle. The reason why the car is being forced to move in a circle is because of the friction between the tires of the car and the tarmac which is on the roundabout. So in this case, the friction force, the kinetic friction force, provides the centripetal force. Are we clear? If kinetic if the kinetic friction is what is providing the centripetal force, then we can write this expression Fc is equal to Ff. The centripetal force is being provided by the friction force. Now, what do we know about friction? We know that friction force, in this case, because the object is moving, the friction force depends on the coefficient of kinetic friction and the normal force. Since this particular object, as it's moving around the roundabout, is not jumping up and down, it's just on the roundabout moving in a circle then in that case, the normal force is equal to the weight of the car, mg. So we substitute for normal force, we put mg, they end up having this. You end up having the friction force is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the mass of the car multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity like that. So that is your, your friction force. With this friction force, we equate it to our expression of centripetal force. Of course, as if a car is going around the roundabout, it needs to go around the roundabout with a particular kind of speed. So in this case, when we equate our centripetal force, this side, the mass of the object, the velocity, the speed squared divided by R equals to mu k, m and g, this side. So you can see there is an m this side, which is the mass of the car. There is an m this side, which is the mass of the car. If you cancel out the m's, you end up having this. You end up having v squared is equals to R equals to mu k multiplied by g where mu k is the coefficient of friction and g is the acceleration due to gravity. You multiply both sides by r other side, uh, you end up having v squared is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction, the acceleration due to gravity, and the radius of the roundabout. Now, how do you get your velocity? In this case, your velocity v is going to be equal to the square root of 
the coefficient of kinetic friction then the acceleration due to gravity and the radius so the velocity with which you can move in a particular roundabout depends on the coefficient of friction which is usually less than zero depends also on the acceleration due to gravity which is what you can't change if you're on earth it's always 9.8 but more importantly it depends on r and how does it depend on r well if you approach a roundabout in this roundabout if the roundabout is small it means that the maximum speed with which you can drive across in this roundabout is going to reduce but if the radius of the roundabout increases then you can travel you can you can, you can, you, you can drive in this roundabout with a higher speed are we clear so the velocity with which you can drive in a roundabout depends on the radius of the roundabout if the roundabout is smaller then you have to reduce the speed with which you're driving this roundabout if the roundabout is bigger then you can drive with a bigger speed this whole thing depends on the size of the roundabout and the radius of the roundabout the other thing it also shows you is that if you are driving in a straight line then you approach a roundabout in that roundabout if you're driving at 100 kilometers per hour you will not be able to drive at 100 kilometers per hour as you approach this roundabout you can't drive at 100 kilometers per hour in this particular roundabout most likely you won't you have to reduce speed because there is a speed limit to roundabouts this doesn't only apply to roundabouts it also applies on a curve if you are driving a straight road then this road starts to cave there is going to be a speed limit with which you can go through this cave so first of all you find a, a, a sign which is telling you that there is a cave up ahead then after the cave you find the speed limit that speed limit is telling you uh what amount of speed you're supposed to be driving with so we've got an example here uh example number one uh what is the maximum speed at which a car can round a cave of radius 25 meter so what is the maximum amount of speed at which a car can round a cave of 25 meters radius on a level road if the coefficient of static friction between the tires of the road is 0 0.8 so we have come up with an expression which is this expression here which gives us what the velocity is going to be if you're going around a roundabout or a cave if you know what the coefficient of friction is you also know the radius so in this case we just substitute our values in this expression here v is equal to the square root of mu s gr so that's going to be our coefficient of friction is uh, 0 0.8 and acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared in the radius of, of the roundabout of the cave is 25 meters so if you do this so if v is going to be 0 0.8 uh 9.8 then multiplied by 2.5 uh, so this is going to give you approximately 14 meters per second so with this roundabout which has got this size and that particular coefficient you can drive on this cave at a maximum speed of 14 meters per second is that clear yes sir there are some questions to be late in the meeting oh okay okay so you can go around this roundabout at 14 meters per second now if you drive at a speed which is higher than 14 meters per second you will not be able to keep your car your bicycle or your motorcycle in this roundabout you're going to go out of the roundabout or out of the cave this also explains one of the reasons why you find accidents happening on caves the reason why you find accidents happening on a cave if there is no if there is no sign to indicate say on this particular cave you're supposed to drive at this amount of time at, at this amount of uh, distance then you will not know how much speed you're supposed to be driving on that particular cave if you do not know how much speed you're supposed to be driving on that particular cave most likely if you maintain the same speed you had as you are approaching this cave you most likely be involved in an accident so the first thing really to do is 
One, if you are in a car or you're driving a car, then you see that there's a cave ahead. You need to reduce your speed. After you reduce your speed, then be on the lookout for a speed limit sign. If the speed limit sign says you're supposed to drive at 60 kilometers, then you drive at maximum of 60 kilometers. If it says 70, then you drive at maximum 70 or you or at a distance at a speed which is less than that. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Next, apart from uh, uh, kinetic friction providing centripetal force, you can also have a case where static friction force can provide centripetal force. An example of what we have is a mass, like as shown in this figure here. You have got this particular mass here. That mass. It has got mass M. Then it, you have got this ring. This ring is rotating at a certain angular velocity and it has got an inner radius R. Now, for this mass to stay where it is, this ring needs to rotate at a certain speed. If this ring rotates at that particular certain speed, then this mass will not be able to fall or slip. And the reason why the mass is not slipping is because the weight of this mass is pulling, is trying to pull the mass down like that. However, there is a friction force which is being exerted upwards. So there's a friction force which is pulling the mass upwards. And in this case, the static friction force is what's providing the centripetal force. So if we know how fast, we know omega, we know how fast the ring is turning, then we also know the radius of the ring then we can work out what the centripetal force is. The centripetal force Fc is going to be equals to the mass of the, the wooden cube which you have there multiplied by the radius of the ring multiplied by omega squared, how fast the ring is going round. This is going to be our centripetal force. Now what we want to find out is the friction. How much friction is needed to keep this particular object in position so that it doesn't slip? If there is friction which is causing an object not to move, then that friction is static friction. We know static friction. Friction, static friction in this case, is going to be given by the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force, Fn. So in this case, since the object doesn't move, then uh, the weight of the object, uh, the normal force is going to be because of the weight of the object, so we end up having the friction force being equals to mu s, the coefficient of static friction, multiplied by the mass and g. So this is the static friction force which is providing the centripetal force. So we equate them. You equate the the centripetal force, which is what we have here, we get the centripetal force, which is what we have here. We equate our centripetal force, Fc, which is equals to this. We equate that to our static friction force, which is what we have here. And that's what we've done here. So we end up with M, R, omega squared is equals to mu S, M, G. Again, we, there's M this side, there's M this side. Then when you cancel out, you end up with R, Omega squared is equal to mu s multiplied by g. So this is what you end up with. The m has been cancelled out. This is basically telling you that the mass is not important. How how heavy, what the mass of the particular object being held in position doesn't is not really important. It can be small, it can be large, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is that it's supposed to be rotating at a particular speed. So in this case, we divide both sides by R. When you divide both sides by R, we end up with uh, omega squared is equals to mu s, which is the coefficient of friction, multiplied by g, divided by R. Then take the square root on both sides, then we're going to end up with omega is equals to the square root of uh, the coefficient of static friction, multiplied by g, divided by R. So this is what gives you the speed or how fast this particular object is supposed to be rotating if that particular wooden block is to stay in position. This, if this thing is to stay in position so that it doesn't slip down, then the 
angular velocity, this angular velocity with which the ring is supposed to be rotating, this angular velocity is given by this expression here. Omega is equal to the square root of the coefficient of static friction multiplied by g divided by r. <coughs> Are we clear? Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> we've got an example here as shown in figure 1. Figure 1 is this one here. This is our figure 1. A bob stuck on a rotating ring. Um, a cylindrical shell of inner radius 1.5 meters rotates at an angular at an angular speed omega. A wooden block rests against the inner surface as it rotates. If the coefficient of static friction between the block and the surface is mu s 0.3, how fast must the shell be rotating if the block is not asleep? So the expression for how fast the shell be should be rotating is this one here. That's what we have found out. So omega is going to be the square root of the coefficient of static friction multiplied by g divided by r. So our mu s in this case uh, is 0.3. Our g is 9.8 and our radius is 1.5. So we substitute here, you end up having a 0 0.3 multiplied by 9.8, then divided by 1.5 in the square root of that. So you end up having your omega being equals to 1.4 radians per second. So this is how fast this particular ring is supposed to be rotating. Are we clear? Uh, yes. Uh, so if the does that mean that if the block inside is the one that's moving, it's supposed to be moving at distance speed or...? No, the block is not moving. Yes, but I'm saying in a situation where the cylinder is not moving but the object inside is moving. Let's take for example a car is, in, is inside. Is that the same speed is also supposed to move at or is different? No, th this, in this case the ring is the one which is rotating. Yes, I'm saying I get this example, now I'm just asking. You're asking what? This string is not connected. Give a different situation. I don't know about that different situation. Okay. So that is one way in which uh, static friction could make could. Uh, that's an example of how static friction could cause an object to move in a circle. Another example of how you can end up with centripetal force is using the force of gravity. For example, you have satellites which are going around the Earth. And these satellites going around the Earth, they move in circular tracks. Some of them move in elliptical paths, but most of them move in circular paths. So if you've got an artificial satellite which is orbiting the Earth, like in this case, uh, this is our planet Earth here, then you can see there is a satellite which is going around moving in space with a velocity v in a circular path like that. This is very, because we, today our, our life depends very much on satellites in rich countries and countries which are able to do that, they regularly put satellites in space so that they can do whatever stuff they want. So in this case, in the case of a satellite, then the centripetal force is provided by the gravitational force. And the gravitational force, Fg, is given by uh, the gravitational constant multiplied by the masses of the objects which are involved in this interaction divided by the radius. So in this case, your F is your gravitational force, your G is the gravitational constant, which is this. Then M is the mass of the first object, then M2 is the mass of the second object, then R in this case is the distance between the masses. So in the case of a satellite, if you have a satellite, one of the M's is going to be this one, the mass of the planet, and the other M is going to be the mass of the satellite. Okay? One of them is going to be the mass of the planet, the other one is going to be the mass of the satellite. So if you put a satellite in space, that satellite is going to move at a particular speed. And it's if you sucks if you successfully put a satellite in orbit, it will move in a circular path like this. It's being forced to move in a circle by its attraction to the Earth, as you can see from this diagram here. 
this force of attraction between the satellite and the earth that is a force of gravity and uh so you can we can end up having this um so in this case when you have a satellite in space this satellite is being forced to move in a circle so it means that this satellite is experiencing a centripetal force which we can work out based on the mass of the satellite and also the distance from the satellite to the center of the earth so in this case uh you end up having your centripetal force fc equals to the mass of the satellite which is ms multiplied by the velocity with which the speed with which the satellite is moving in space v squared divided by the distance from the satellite to the center of the earth which is what we have as ras here so ms is the mass of the spacecraft or satellite then v is the velocity or the speed of the satellite in space then r is the radius of the satellite orbit so that being the case are we clear here to say that uh if you have a satellite in space moving like this there has to be a centripetal force causing that satellite to move in this particular path Is it clear? Just that in this case, the, the, the gravitational force is the same as the, the centripetal force. The gravitational force is the one which is providing the centripetal force. Oh, all right. Sir. Yes. Any other question? So you've got gravity providing the centripetal force. So this is our centripetal force like that, which is the mass of the spacecraft multiplied by the velocity and the speed of the space, uh, satellite in space uh, divided by the radius, that. Now, this centripetal force is being provided by the force of gravity, Fg. And the force of gravity, Fg, in this case, is going to be G multiplied by the mass of the spacecraft, which is the mass of the satellite, Ms, multiplied by the mass of our planet, which is our Earth, then divided by... Uh, the radius of the distance between the satellite and the center of the earth which is r r s squared like this so this is the force of gravity which is providing the centripetal force since the force of gravity is providing the centripetal force basically it means that the centripetal force is equal to the force of gravity so we can equate them and when you equate them, this is what you end up with. You end up having the mass of the spacecraft multiplied by the speed of the spacecraft in space, uh, V squared divided by R equals to G, which is the gravitational uh, attraction, the, sorry, the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the spacecraft multiplied by the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the spacecraft's orbit, R S squared. Uh, there is the mass of the spacecraft in this side, there is also mass of the spacecraft on that side. So if you cancel out the ms, you cancel out m, ms like that. You go. But there is also an rs this side. There are two r. There is rs squared this side. So if you cancel out this, you're going to remain with an rs this side. So you're going to remain with v squared is equal to g mp rs. Are we clear? Then if you take the square root on both sides here, if you take the square root on both sides, you end up with V is equals to the square root of G MP RS. So what this is showing is that when you have a satellite in space, the speed of the satellite in space, the velocity with which your satellite is going to be moving depends on one the mass of the planet so the bigger the planet the more the velocity of the spacecraft is going to be it also depends on the radius of the planet the radius not, not the radius of the planet but the radius of the satellite's circular track so the smaller the radius the larger the radius you would a large radius then they think there's a reduction here there's some kind of an inverse uh, relationship like that but mostly the mass of the planet so the bigger your planet then your satellites will move faster okay so there's an example here uh example number three are we clear here before we move on to the example uh, 
question. Yes. So, how do we do it, deal with the situation whereby maybe you've been given the radius of the A and then the, and with the distance of the of maybe the satellite and the A? How do you get the same distance? You add the radius, the distance of the radius, and then the distance of the the center of the A to the radius. Yes. That's what this example number three is about. Oh, all right. So with example number three, a spacecraft, a, a spaceship orbits the moon at a height of 20,000 meters, assuming it to be only subject to the gravitational pull of the moon, find the speed and the time it takes for one orbit. For the moon, the mass of the moon MM is uh, 7.34 times 10 to the power 22 kgs, and the radius of the moon is 1.738 times 10 to the power 6. So in this case, we know the radius of the moon is this much. That's the radius of the moon. We also know the height of the spacecraft above the surface of the moon, which is 20,000. So we can find this error. If you look at this image here, you can find this error. This error is from the spacecraft all the way up to the center of the object this, this spacecraft is going around with, uh, around okay so in this case you combine the radius of the planet plus the height above the surface of this particular planet are we clear that's what this error is showing here it is from the center of earth plus the height above this particular planet so we need to find error which is our error is uh, for the spacecraft, so RS for the spacecraft, the radius of the spacecraft's orbit is going to be equal to the radius of the planet, which is the moon in this case, plus the height above the moon, where RP is the radius of the moon, then the H is the height of the spacecraft above the moon, and that is going to be what you have here 1.738 times 10 to the power 6 meters plus 20,000, and that's going to give you RS as 1.758 times 10 to the power 6. So this is your RS, which is the radius of this uh, spacecraft, spaceship's uh, circular track. Since you're looking for the velocity, so V is going to be equal to the square root of G multiplied by MP, which is the mass of this particular body or planet this spacecraft is going around, divided by our RS. So the, our G is a constant. We know what G is. You'll be given what G is. This is G, like that. Then the mass of the planet, so we're talking about the moon, which is the whose mass is 7.34 uh, times 10 to the power 22. Then divide that by the radius of the spacecraft circular track, which is that. When you do that, you end up having a velocity v, which is going to be equal to 1669 meters per second. So in this case, this spacecraft is going to be moving around the moon at a speed of 1667 meters per second. This is very fast. So these things, these satellites in space, they move very, very fast. So the spacecraft has a tangential speed of 1,687 meters per second. Okay, are we clear? Yes, sir. Next, we want to find out how much time does it take the spacecraft to go around the moon once? So to do that, we have to be, we have to find out because if a spacecraft goes round once, like in this case, what, what we have here, if a spacecraft goes round once like that, if it goes, it does one revolution, okay? If a spacecraft does one revolution like that, we know how much angular distance one revolution is. One revolution is two pi radians. So when it doesn't matter in terms of, as long as the spacecraft goes around once a planet, the angular distance is two pi radians. So we know how much distance will have to be covered for one revolution, it's two pi radians. If it's two pi radians, then we have to find out how fast is the spacecraft traveling in terms of radians per second. We have our spacecraft traveling at 1,697 meters per second. How fast, how much is this in terms of radians per second? Or basically, what is the angular speed of our spacecraft? 
So in this case, recall that your velocity v is equals to the radius of the spacecraft circular track multiplied by the angular velocity omega. So if you're looking for how fast the spacecraft is going, which is omega, then you have to make omega the subject of the formula. So you end up with omega is equals to the velocity of the spacecraft multiplied by the radius of its circular track, circular path. So that's going to be 1,669 meters per second divided by the radius of its circular track, which is going to give you an angular velocity of 9.5 times 10 to the power minus 4 radians per second. So how do we get our time from this bit here, omega? You have to remember that, remember we showed earlier that our, we, I think we, we showed an expression of omega to say, uh, if, and when we started, we said if a, an object goes round in a circle, right? The amount of distance it has covered, it has covered is two pi radians. And the amount of time it's going to do this is going to be what is called the period. So in this case, we expressed our, in that case, we expressed our angular velocity omega in terms of two pi, which is the angular distance multiplied by the frequency, how fast this particular thing is going around like that. Then this frequency is equals to one over T. The T is the period, which is the amount of time it takes the spacecraft to go around in a circle. So with this period, we can we end up having omega is equals to two pi, which is the distance covered for one revolution divided by the t, which is the time it takes the spacecraft to take cover this one revolution. Now we have this bit here. We we have our angular speed, which is what we have found here. Our angular speed is nine point five times ten to the power minus four radians per second. There. So with this angular speed, we can make the period the subject of the formula we end up having t is equal to 2 pi divided by omega now this 2 pi is not just 2 pi this is 2 pi radians which is the angular displacement the 2 pi here represents 2 pi radians for the angular displacement covered when your spacecraft does one revolution so in that case you end up having period is equal to 2 pi radians divided by omega so you end up with 2 pi divided by this the angular speed like that so you end up having a period t which is equals to 6681 seconds so this is how many seconds it will take this spacecraft to go around the moon once 6601 seconds this 6601 seconds can be changed into minutes so when you change that into minutes you're going to get yourself uh, 110 minutes and 18 seconds so this is basically how much time it takes your spacecraft to go around the moon. Is it clear? Uh, um, what if you are asked to find what if you are asked to find the number of revolutions the spacecraft goes around the Earth? How can you find that? The number of revolutions is once. We're only interested in one. We are, we are saying if you are asked, it's just if one you are revolution. In, in, in this case, we are we are interested in finding out how much time it takes your spacecraft to do one revolution. That's what you're interested in finding out. Now, sir, if you have a question, why you are required to find the number of revolutions? The I'm number. Not, there is uh, nothing about, about the 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 num the number of revolutions. You can only find out how many number of revolutions if they, they tell you this is how much time has passed. Because we know in 6,600 uh, and something like that, the thing goes around once. This is what you found. This is just for one revolution. So I don't know exactly what you are trying to ask. In how much time? In one day? How many times does it go around the moon? One day has got 24 hours. 24 hours times uh, 60 minutes. Right? Then you find the number of minutes which are there. Uh, then times 60, you find the number of seconds. If you want to find say, how many times does it go around in one day, you can work it out. Since you already know how much time it takes to do one revolution. Does that answer your question?
Are we clear? Yes. Um, here to find the the the, the angular velocity. Are we supposed to add the radius of the earth and the radius the distance from? That's what we did. Here. Yeah. The radius of the the spacecraft circular track is equal to the radius of the earth plus the height of the spacecraft above the uh, of the radius of the moon plus the height of the spacecraft above the moon is that clear yes it's clear okay any other questions Okay, so if there are no questions, we'll stop here today. We'll finish up this thing tomorrow where we'll look at uh, another type of force which provides antipedal force, which is the tension. So we'll look at, I think, two more forces tomorrow. Tension and also, I think, the, the, the component of the normal force where you go to banking. So we'll look at how tension provides antipedal force tomorrow. Okay, so we end here today. Uh, the recording will be made available on YouTube and later on the links will be shared on Modo. Alright, so... Uh, this is not on the module. Yes, up to some point, up to where we have done, up, up to where we have reached today. You will find a version of the notes there. But I will update them so that the whole thing can be changed. The other things, because I'm still trying to rewrite stuff. So that by tomorrow you have the completely all the everything nicely arranged so i would advise you to wait up to you can download what's there just consider what's there up to where we are okay then i'll finish up doing whatever stuff i have to do then later on you can look at the whole thing you can re-download the nodes basically by end of tomorrow yeah? Any other question? Okay, so if there are no further questions, we'll stop here. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow.